Hi, um, I'm Eric Toon. I'm here with Daniel Smith. We're both longtime Kubernetes com uh, contributors since before it was uh, public. And we're going to talk today about extensibility in Kubernetes. And OK. So before I start talking about extensibility, let me address uh, who I think cares about this. So cluster operators are going to want to understand the components that are deployed in their clusters, even if they're you know, not writing ext extensions. And they, will, uh, they may want to create site-specific policy. Distribution creators will want to know how to, how to integrate with um, infrastructure as a service. Cloud providers especially will want to integrate with their own infrastructure as a service, maybe add new APIs that expose you know, unique or specific features in their cloud. PaaS authors, because Kubernetes is a good platform to build platforms as a service on top of, uh, may want to create add new APIs, but still be able to dive down into Kubernetes for debugging into the underlying implementation. Hardware and software vendors may want to add new APIs to Kubernetes or expose unique storage or uh, network features. Most importantly, if you're a core contributor or any kind of Kubernetes user, you're going to benefit from stabilization to the core of the core of the Kubernetes project. So right now we have a lot of pressure to add new features constantly, and yet our users are asking us for a more stable product, less changes, release notes are ridiculously long. So the answer there is to break that up and to so have software components with different maturity levels. The core needs to become very mature, and yet we still want a rich ecosystem of uh, extensions or plugins that can have different levels of maturity, different release cadences. I tried to come up with like a short definition of what it means to be, be using extensibility in Kubernetes, um, or what's an extension and what's not an extension, and I actually couldn't come up with one that I could fit in a sentence. So let me first start by talking about what Kubernetes is and, and what it is not, what isn't extending Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is open source, so you always have the option of forking it, um, and feel free, that's hard. It's projects moving really fast. The code base is really big, and it's hard to figure out where the point is you want to extend things. There's constant refactoring going on. And finally, if you're, a lot of Kubernetes users are using Kubernetes in a hosted environment. I think at least the top four clouds probably have hosted Kubernetes. I'm not sure exactly. You could argue over exactly what the ranking is, but there's a lot of hosted Kubernetes out there. And I don't think any of those people want to support a fork. Uh, so another way you can use Kubernetes is by what I call automating, which means just taking this, the, the, what I call the normal APIs, things that you would normally post resources to, and then using our client to um, automate that process once you have a, you know, need to do things multiple times. We have clients in, I think, seven different languages, so that's easy. But automation doesn't cover everything. It's not good for things, it's, it's asynchronous, so it's not good when you need to hook into every event, make sure that you don't miss anything, block things before they happen. Uh, it can't add APIs, and it can't change the behavior of existing APIs. So when you need to be synchronous, when you need to add APIs or change them or add new features, then you need an extension. Now, Kubernetes, I think if you, maybe somebody went to Hen's keynote um, this morning, she mentioned there are like 12 different extension points in Kubernetes. Guess what? I'm going to exhaustively list those for you with the help of Daniel. Um, in fact, there's so many ways to extend that it can be a bit overwhelming. So part of this is going to, this talk is going to give you a guide of maybe which ones you want, how to combine them, and how to think about our roadmap, whether you should sort of trust this morass of extension possibilities. Hopefully you'll come out believing that, you know, there's at least some you want to use. So I like to say that Kubernetes is really two separate things to me. It's an abstraction over infrastructure. And, it, and it's also a framework for declarative APIs and distributed control. And those are actually pretty separate. Like a lot of people are talking, coming to me and saying, hey, I want to use Kubernetes to style APIs, but I actually don't need pods and services and nodes. So I think in the year or two, we're going to start to see more of that. That's not what this talk is about. Um, so we've got a dozen extension mechanisms. And 
for me, it's useful to categorize them into two rough groups. One is what I call infrastructure extension mechanisms, which matches my first definition. And the second one is API extension mechanisms. Um, Daniel and I are gonna divide this up. I'll talk about infrastructure extensions, and then Daniel will dive into the API. So it's December for me, I'm getting excited. I'm thinking about skiing. Uh, maybe some of you are pretty excited too, so then you know what this is. I didn't hear woots from everyone, so maybe I should ex explain this for a second. These are like the difficulty codes you get when you go skiing to tell you how hard a run is. Uh, a green circle means you know beginners can go there. Double black diamond is the hardest, and sort of in this order. And so trans I tried to translate this to Kubernetes. Green meant like, I have high confidence that, that you can find examples, documentation, you have to write a small amount of code, you get a good choice of languages, and you're unlikely to bork your cluster by trying to write one of these extensions, or if you do, you'll be able to understand what's going on. It doesn't affect everything in the cluster, it only affects what you're extending. Um, and the project is likely to extend it. Uh, so it's to support, support this extension mechanism going forward, we're not planning to deprecate or anything like that. So the negation of all those would be a, like a double black diamond. So we're gonna see all these ones as we go. Some of, these, some of these runs are gonna get groomed you know, over the next year, so they'll get easier, but for now, this is the current state. Um, so let me go on infrastructure extensibility. I put, if you guys are the type of person who likes to actually like, get way more data uh, while I'm talking and ignore me, then there's a URL up there for some docs that actually just merged. Uh, they give a lot more detail about all the extension mechanisms in the Kubernetes.io docs. Um, and I will, I see people taking pictures, that's fine, please tweet, whatever. I promise that we'll upload the current PDFs afterwards, so you can, if that's what you're doing, you can relax your cameras. Um, so I'll start with storage extensions. So storage extensions allow you to add new kinds of volumes to your pods, things that get mounted as a POSIX file system. This is not intended to like handle API-based storage, like bucket storage. It's meant to handle things that have a Unix file, file API. So there's actually two different mechanisms. Flex volumes came first. These are super easy to write. I think I saw someone write a volume plugin. And a plugin, by the way, means a binary that gets called out by the kubelet or another component of the Kubernetes system. Um, someone wrote one in Bash with like 100 lines, including a really long copyright header. So I thought it was pretty amazing. Uh, the plan for that, I just talked to Saad Ali, who's uh, one of the leads in uh, SIG storage, and uh, he said expect flex volume support to s stick around indefinitely, but we're not gonna make it better. But uh, to me, it's super easy, so I think that's great. Th this new thing that just came out in 1.9 is called container storage interface. It's really open, Docker, Mesos, and Kubernetes all support this type of plugin, and it's easier to upgrade and deploy on top of Kubernetes. Instead of having to like go into your node file system and like upgrade a bash script, you can actually deploy the CSI plugins as a daemon set, which I think is really cool. Um, I'd expect this one to stick around and grow. It's alpha and 1.9, it's gonna get better in the next year. Um, infrastructure, let's see, cloud container managers, um, this is factoring out, like right now, you have a choice when you run your master to say like, hey, I'm on AWS, or I'm on GCP, or, or whatever, or I'm not on any of those. Um, we're gonna move that code out, so I, and so it's actually gonna be a separate binary. And that almost got in 1.9, but it's gonna, it looks like it's gonna be alpha in 1.10, and I would expect to see a lot of, a lot of changes there in uh, 2018. Device plugins, that's a way to like allow discrete hardware resources to be surfaced from your kubelets. So things I could, when I Google for this, I saw people talk about GPUs, FPGAs, QRNGs, which I hadn't even heard of. Apparently that's like a random number generator. I don't know if that's for like financial traders or, or something, I don't know, does anyone know what that's for? Okay, so I thought that was cool. Like it's being used to extend resources I hadn't even heard of. Um, so so this, is, this is pretty basic, but it's cool, it lets you surface them to the, the scheduler so you can see which nodes have these and which ones don't. This is alpha and 1.8. I expect to see that get fancier. Um, let's see, for s network plugins, um, this, there's an open standard called CNI and there's like a couple dozen of these plugins and they, I think they started with Docker but we had to tweak it a little bit to get it to work with 
everywhere with Kate's because we have uh, Kubernetes because of host port. So I think there's a couple that support Kubernetes fully, and I expect to see more of those over time. Um, this is a little bit uh, trickier. Like I think this uses a gRPC instead of being a binary plugin. Um, I know the least about this, so I should stop talking. Uh, all right. Oh, wow, well, that did not format. So those diamonds are supposed to be like side by side, but so. Uh, this one's one that scares me the most. This is like, and I like double black diamond runs, but this, like I broke my leg snowboarding. This is like, this is the scary run for me, is replacing the scheduler. Um, you can replace the scheduler with your own scheduler, um, but like, I think that'll bark your cluster personally. I would talk to the SIG. They're doing a lot of refactoring. I, I, would, I would think twice before doing that. The easiest thing, although it didn't render right on the slides, this one's called scheduler extender, is actually the easiest one to do. You can add your own prioritization. So if you're like, oh yeah, those machines on like rack 23, I really wanna use those because I can't wait for them to burn up. Um, you can like put in a plugin model that says always prefer to put this stuff on those machines, uh, you know, if, if it fits. And uh, let's see, secrets, uh, 1.9, like the secrets that are stored in etcd are now encrypted at rest. So there's like a data encryption key and a key encryption key. And like right now, I think the key encryption key is like on the, like in a file. But the plan is for 1.10, you'd be able to actually put that key encryption key in like a KMS, like vault, and that'll be an extension where it can like call out to your KMS. And so that'll make people happier. It's, that's been a long, asked for for a long time. Um, and I talked to one of the leads on that and said, maybe by uh, end of 2018, I'll have to be some GA on that encryption at rest support. All right, so those are all the um, infrastructure extension mechanisms I want you to know about. Uh, and I'm gonna hand off to Daniel, he's gonna talk about. Um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about, uh, let's, work. let's talk about uh, API. Hmm. Does it work better if I hold it here? Let's talk about uh, API extensibility. So um, I broke down a, a little, okay, you can sort of see it. I broke down a little uh, spectrum of, of uh, some various API level integration extension points, um, going from easiest to hardest. Uh, we have CRDs. How many of you know what a CRD is? Okay, great, most of you. Um, uh, next we have a CRD and you can put a schema in there. Or we have a CRD plus a schema plus a validation webhook. That's uh, getting a little bit more difficult. And then finally, if you really want a challenge, you can use an aggregated API server. All of these are mechanisms for adding your own API object into the system. So let's talk a little bit about those in more detail. Um, in 2018, I expect CRDs to go to GA. Uh, along the way, I expect us to improve completeness. Uh, we already have a schema. Um, we're gonna make it easy to make validation webhooks. Uh, we're gonna make it easy to set permissions. Um, yeah, so, so it should integrate with RBAC, and the author of the CRD should be able to tell what permissions, what roles does it make sense to operate on the CRD. Um, we shouldn't force the cluster administrator to understand that. Um, and I expect to improve uh, aspects of the API-wide consistency. Like um, we have a status pattern, we have a scale pattern, uh, we have a few common sub-resources like that. Uh, I expect to add mechanisms to CRD so that you can seamlessly integrate those uh, so, so that you can, we can have HPA, horizontal pod, autoscaler, work on your CRD. So you can scale up your CRD instead of scaling up your deployment. Um, so things like that. And, uh, yeah, there's lots of stuff that we can do if we have a common status, uh, which I think is in a future slide. <laughs> so when people hear about CRDs and they hear about uh, aggregated API servers, um, the, the question is invariably, how do I know which one to do what with? Or um, if you look at a CRD, it's pretty easy. You submit a YAML file to the system, it gives you a new resource. Uh, but if you look at a, ag making an aggregated API server, it doesn't look so easy because you have to compile stuff and import a library and there's a API server builder program but uh, uh, you've got to do a bunch of extra steps. So why do we have both? Um, 
Uh, I thought it might be useful to say why exactly you need uh, you would ever need to use a aggregated API server instead of a CRD, and uh, the the really there's actually the the number of things is shrinking over time. So the the one thing that I expect to never change is with a with an aggregated API server you can completely change the storage mechanism. So if you are doing like our uh, metrics API server, if you are fabricating data uh, for somebody who wants to watch or or, or uh, pull. Um, an aggregated API server is really the only option. Um, and that's the, the metrics is high, vol high volume data, it's manufactured, it's, it's uh, aggregated together. Um, so yeah, it doesn't make sense for that to be in a CRD. Um, something that is true today and will be less true in the future uh, as soon as 1.9 goes, uh, goes out live. Um, the admission chain, uh, you can, if you have an aggregated API server, you can put you know, whatever random business logic you want in the admission chain. Um, and uh, something that is true today and might not be true at the end of 2018 is that the aggregated API server allows you to write arbitrary version transformation. So if you have uh, the first version of your resource and you make a bunch of awesome changes and you have the second version of your resource uh, with the aggregated API server framework, you can automatically upgrade people. Who is this, who, who is this for? Um, we wrote this, uh, we, we had somewhat in mind extension developers, but we had in mind ourselves a lot. Uh, the Kubernetes repo is very large. Uh, it is twisty and turny and full of passages all alike. Uh, and it is getting to be difficult to change, to make changes that don't have effects that ripple out th through the entire thing. So the idea is that we split, we give API authors their own binaries, and uh, uh, they have, there's, there's less of a chance of them interacting poorly with another component. Um, yeah, so, so the, the idea is many targeted API servers rather than one massive API server. So I mentioned on the previous side that admission stack, what is, what is the admission stack? Um, it is everything between the authorization check, the permissions check, and before we actually commit the request. So everything between the permissions check and the storage layer. Uh, and this is where we do all of the, all the fun stuff like checking quota or making sure that your, uh, making sure that your pod image pull policy is, is what, the, uh, what the, your system administrator wants. Um, this is the ideal place for policy enforcement. But there's a problem. <laughs> it's all compiled in. Um, so if you wanted to use this uh, uh, before 1.9, your option was to fork API server and write a compiled in admission control plugin. Um, if you've contemplated forking API server, you'll be very happy that we have uh, produced webhooks. So you can now dynamically register a webhook. Uh, the API you have to implement is relatively simple. Um, you can get called whenever an object changes, when it's posted, uh, when somebody tries to delete it. Uh, I, I should double check that one. I, th I, th I think you can get that. <laughs> um, it's beta in 1.9, and we intend to take it to GA in 2018. Um, the dynamic configuration should be awesome. So you can do this in a, in a cluster, like the, res the resource has to be on, but you don't have to mess with uh, flags on API server. You don't have to let mess with config maps. You can just add a configuration object to the system. Um, another option for a similar purpose is initializers. Um, We've sort of been working on both initializers and, and uh, uh, webhooks. Initializers are in alpha, and at some point in the course of 2018, we expect to make a decision about whether we will uh, go all in on webhooks or if there is a place for initializers also. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what else are we going to do in 2018? I expect to be in the business of moving flags into config files for, for Cube API server. Um, and 
Ideally, I also expect to move config files into APIs where it's appropriate. Um, I, I don't like the fact that to change things about API server, you have to twiddle with the flags and restart it right now. I think that's very inconvenient for cluster operators. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, as a concrete example of this sort of thing, the uh, permissions or OSC webhook, right now it's a command line flag and it's a uh, config file, and you can only have one. Um, I think we need to, that, 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 that's, that's a great example of something else that I can see lots of people wanting, wanting to add. The difference between the permissions check webhook and the uh, admission check webhook is that the uh, admission check, any one of them can fail the request, and you can also modify a request with the admission webhook. Um, but for permissions, uh, it only takes, I guess you, you can now, they've, they've, uh, they've they fixed it, you can now deny a request, but uh, it, it must pass everybody. Yeah. Um, and my, my goal, my ultimate goal is fully portable extensions. You write an extension on, uh, that runs on one cluster, you should be able to move it to another cluster. Just like the, the goal of Kubernetes is portable workloads, um, I think your, your, your extensions are not going to find a wide audience unless you can be confident that you can take them with you to whatever uh, cluster or cloud environment you want to run on. Um, on. And with that, I think back to Eric on how can you combine these various extension mechanisms. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so there's a a bunch of different choices of extension mechanisms, and I kind of categorize them. But that doesn't mean you can't mix and match them. Um, <clears throat> so I, I can put a couple of examples up here. Uh, I was just talking to a gentleman here who works on the Rook project, and they actually use a, I, I didn't know this, they use a CRD plus volume plugins, so you can like post a CRD that describes a certain type of volume and then have that show up. That was cool. Uh, I don't know the details, but, uh, um, and then I found out that Calico Canal, um, I don't know much about it, but apparently uses a CRD plus a network plugin. The basic combination is a CRD plus control of automation. That's like we call the operator pattern. You've probably heard that, um, especially if it's like running an applicate, like a, a database or something. We call that operator pattern. Um, and then Daniel mentioned that when you can use the mission webhooks plus CRDs to get better validation on them. I'm really curious to see what sort of interesting combinations people will come up with, like combining like a, a storage plugin with you know an, uh, an Aussie plugin or something. I don't know. So look, next year we'll tell. Um, so Daniel talked a little bit where we're heading. Uh, I want to also share my aspirations for the next year. Um, I want to see automatic, rich, C like if you write a CRD or any kind of customer source, uh, and it should just automatically in the CLI and the GUI, GUI give you a good experience. That means like, you know, you should be able to say Kubi Kuddle get and have the right columns that you intended when you list it out. Um, you should be able to, you know, in your UI, you should be able to see like a red dot if it has unhappy status to it. So that's somewhat aspirational, but that's the direction we want to head. Um, also want, like right now you can build customer sources on top of the platform, but then you can't build, take existing things and have them come on top of the customer sources as well. Daniel mentioned this, adding a scale resource will allow you to use HPA. Also it lets you use uh, pod disruption budgets, which I'm talking about uh, tomorrow if you're going to be there. Um, Another thing I've heard is that as people are seeing their um, customer sources mature, they're missing that version conversion. Uh, so I think personally, that's a big priority for us to figure out in 2018. We don't know how we're going to do it yet. So uh, please find me if you have ideas on how to do that. Uh, and then Daniel suggested like a cluster introspection ID, API. So one thing we do in GUIs is when you create a, so a typical pattern with like a customer source is that it makes more resources and those resources make more resources. But as a viewer, you typically only want to see the top level thing that you created, except when it breaks, then you want to debug and expand it. So I want this to be a pervasive pattern in UIs where like you just see the top level resource, but then if you'd want to drill down, you can find the things. And if you see an error message from a pod, you can tie that back up to its parent 
Um, and the API server actually has all that information in a graph used by the garbage collector, but I think there's a lot more we could do with that. So that's, um, that's one more thing I hope we do. So I hope you, I've convinced you that like, the Kubernetes project has a strong commitment to being extensible, um, maintaining that extensibility across all platforms. You can see that from the number of extension points we have, the number of talks about extensibility, uh, keynotes that mentioned it. Uh, completing these is a large part of the work for several SIGs in the next year. Uh, you can also see a commitment to open standards where they apply. For example, CSI and CNI are used by other orchestrators, and CRDs use JSON schema. And I'm very interested in more opportunities to uh, reuse open standards with Kubernetes, especially extensibility. Um, and I, with that, I think, Daniel, I can take questions. Yeah, I think we have time for a few questions. Question was um, if, if we have to use uh, uh, Kubernetes for orchestrating non-containerized services along with containerized services? Do we have to write our own, uh, our own uh, uh, extensions? Um, is, is that a pattern at all that you've seen? Like I have HSM and Kafka and others that are not containerized, but there are other containerized services. So the pattern I see is some people are starting to use Kubernetes style APIs, maybe even using CRDs uh, and an operator to manage resources that actually don't have pods under them. So it could be like serverless, which might be on top of Kubernetes or might not. I think Red Hat OpenShift has an extension, allows you to manage your VMs uh, using a custom resource. So I would say it's fine to use a custom resource to manage infrastructure that's not containers. And yeah. happy to follow up on that. And uh, I've had multiple requests today already for uh, sort of API server without a Kubernetes cluster. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would look for something along those lines in the future. I'd also have a call out to people that are like less container people and more like API deep thinkers to come uh, join the conversation. We, we want to hear from you. Uh, next question. Uh, I just had, first of all, I want to put my vote on initializers. Yay, initializers. Um, <laughs> second, it'd be super helpful um, when I want to use an initializer, I'm a bit concerned putting it on some of the core resources because like, I want to put it on pods. But it would be kind of cool in my mind to have initializers target based on labels. So it's like, oh yeah, this is an initializer for pods like this, and then don't stick it on the rest, I don't care. Because right now you, you have to process every single one or they won't get initialized. So I, I, have, to, I, have, uh, I have two thoughts on that. One is we're a little scared if you put them on pods too. I, I, it's, I'm doing it. So. Um, the other thought is uh, we, uh, for the admission web folks to make them safe, we added a namespace uh, selector. Uh, so that it's possible to have namespaces in oh. which the, the plugin doesn't apply. So when's that? Where's that at? In uh, that's that's uh, the configuration object. Yeah. When's it? Is it available in one eight though? One point nine. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we want you to try webhooks in one nine and then come back to us in like a quarter and say yeah. how that went. Can you modify objects in webhooks? I thought it was just you can, you can in one point nine. nine. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Give it a try. Okay. You can So related to that, um, can you modify objects before storing using custom admission? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the admission webhooks come in two flavors. There's a validating and a mutating one. Um, and the mutating one runs on both posts and puts. So both creates and updates, and you can make modifications to the object. OK, um, and you can install new admissions without restarting the API server? That's correct. There's okay. a dynamic configuration API. Awesome. So can I ask a few more questions? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> OK, so the other question is, uh, I know pod presets were something that allowed injection. And I haven't read about initializers. So what's the main difference between initializers and pod presets? Both allow injection, I thought. Do they both uh, allow yeah, injection uh, of uh, containers? Why don't we let Eric answer that one? <laughs> 
So there wasn't complete agreement on exactly what the pod preset API should be. So instead of putting it in core, the decision for now is to put it in the service catalogs um, resource uh, uh, API groups. And I think the intent is to use, uh, in a future version, to use the mutating webhooks as what service catalog builds the pod preset on top of. And then they're gonna run with that for a while and get feedback on whether the API is good. And then there can be a conversation whether that needs to pull into core or what. But it also shouldn't be too hard to build something similar if you have a special use case. Um, and we'd be happy to chat afterwards about that. Yeah, so what's the, can we contrast the Cloud Provider API and the, the Extension APIs? Um, yeah, what do you think about that? Um, so the Cloud Provider manages like IP address ranges for services. Uh, I think it might help with ingresses. It manages like the life cycle of nodes and detecting when like the, the backing instance of a node has disappeared. It probably does some other stuff I don't know anymore. Um, so. It's possible that it might get broken up into more um, like individual webhooks if there's a demand for that. But right now, the, the, the low hanging fruit is just getting it to be a separate release train. Uh, and I think we'll just let that soak for a while before we decide. It's definitely not overlapping. Like the, it's, 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 about no, it's more about nodes whereas, and, I, and physical resources, whereas the, all the other infrastructure yeah. ones I talked about are about like bringing those physical resources into the pod abstraction. So they mostly don't overlap. Yeah, I see, I see, the, uh, I see the cloud provider uh, as like a, another downward facing uh, extension, sort of like the, the infrastructure ex extensions. Are we running out of time here? We got time for one more. Yeah. Okay. We've got another. You had a bullet point about uh, how you don't want people to replace schedulers, um, and I just want to just want to understand where you're coming from, or trying to understand um, what you've run into, what issues you've run into, based on uh, your experience. So th those are my personal opinions, and not just that run looks scary to me. Maybe you're like an expert skier, you've already been down, and it's not that bad. Uh, but I, I do think that there's, um, I think with dual schedulers, it will, if you go too far down the dual scheduler path, it'll limit the ability in the future for us to add better like resource sharing primitives that we would like to add like a year from now. So I think at some point that might get broken. But maybe it solves your immediate need. We have a, we have Bobby from the scheduler team oh, right here. Let's let Bobby talk then. Sorry. No, uh, no. I actually share um, um, everything that Eric said. So as we're going forward, it seems uh, harder and harder to uh, support other schedulers, especially competing schedulers, which, uh, which is sometimes the case in some of the clusters. So people run multiple schedulers at the same time. But as a scheduler is advancing and adding more features it becomes harder and harder to keep that promise that we are completely scheduler agnostic, feel free to replace our schedule. And that, was, that was sort of like the uh, promise initially, but it becomes harder and harder. So, so basically, uh, nobody prevents you from replacing the scheduler, but uh, we are sort of uh, like giving you a heads up. Um, I don't want to use warning, but uh, you, giving you a heads up that it may, may become harder and harder, and, maintaining a customer scheduler which completely replaces the scheduler may become very hard. So uh, what we encourage people is to keep running a default scheduler. Default scheduler is uh, very uh, configurable. You can pretty much disable everything that it does, almost. Um, and uh, by everything, I mean all the predicates and priorities that it supports. Uh, and uh, it's pluggable currently. We are also improving the pluggability of the architecture and the performance of extensions. So hopefully it should be enough uh, for almost everybody. Yeah, I, I might summarize it as like, like a, a Go package might export an interface and they're committing to like not adding new functions or changing the signatures of that interface. And like webhooks, 
when that becomes GA, like that'll be, we're committed to not changing that. And we already don't think we're gonna change it a lot. The scheduler does not have a well-defined interface. It has 100 responsibilities, and we might add 50 more in the next year. So you, you, you'll be running to keep up. Is that, yeah. Yeah, there's basically the same reasons why we uh, prefer you to just use etcd as the backing storage, and we didn't want a bunch of different storage backends. I mean, people also replace Kublet, which is to me even crazier than replacing the scheduler. But like, I mean, you know, if you've got a big enough team, then then go for it. You know. Yeah, you know the Kubernetes is the Thesis ship. Uh, let's let's stop there, and Daniel and I'll be sure to hang out uh, in the hallway afterwards. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>